Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today for the Driving for Work webinar. My name is Alison Coleman. I'm the Director of People Development and Culture in the Road Safety Authority. Today's webinar is hosted by the Road Safety Authority, the Health and Safety Authority, and on Gorda Síochána for companies large and small who want to ensure their employees are safe on the road. The objective of this today's seminar is to inform and educate employers about how to implement safe driving for work practices. Those who drive for work have a higher collision rate than the general driving population. Those who drive company cars, vans, buses and HGVs are more likely to take some risks when driving, increasing their likelihood of being involved in a road accident. The greater the time spent behind the wheel, the greater the exposure to risks associated with driving for work. It is estimated that those driving for work account for involvement in about one in three accidents per year. In addition to the cost of human lives, driving for work incidents create a financial burden for employers. Vehicle repair costs, worker absence, third party claims and lost business opportunities. Driving for work also poses risks for fellow workers, members of the public, road users, especially vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. The aim of today's Driving for Work webinar is to help employers and employees avoid these preventable incidents and injuries to themselves, passengers, and other people when driving for work. It should be used to inform employers driving for work policies and procedures. Guiding all of our work is Vision Zero. This is Ireland's long-term goal of achieving zero road deaths or serious injuries by 2050. This goal is supported by an action plan, currently which runs from 2021 to 2024. This action plan has 50 high impact actions, 136 support actions across seven safe system areas, one of which is safe work related road use. This action plan is well underway with a number of stakeholders across the country. And indeed this event places attention on our role as employers and how we can contribute in a meaningful and real way to achieving vision zero. Today's webinar is going to focus mainly on light commercial vehicles, and we'll look at a range of topics, including behaviours that increase the likelihood of incidences when driving for work, and how to manage these risks, how to implement safe driving for work practices, key requirements for light commercial vehicle management, and we'll also be showcasing some best practice examples of effective driving for work safety management. We'll also take you through some of the resources that the Road Safety Authority, the Health and Safety Authority and Ingvarda Siakona have developed to assist employers in understanding how to manage driving for work risks safely and effectively. Today, you're going to hear from a number of speakers who are all here to represent each of the agencies and that have contributed to ensuring safe driving for work practices and resources are available to employers and employees. There'll be four presentations in the first half of this webinar. You're going to hear from representatives from the Road Safety Authority, the Health and Safety Authority and Angarda Siakona. Then following this morning's presentations, we'll take a short break, planning for that at around 10.40. Um, after that break, we will then hear from representatives from Irish Water and Air Liquid. All of our speakers will join us live at the end of this presentation, and we're going to open the floor then for questions. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to submit questions through the Q&A submission box. It would be great if you could all add the name of the presenter that you wish to us to direct your question to when submitting. We really are aiming to finish today's webinar by 12 p.m., just in time for everyone to grab a bit of lunch before heading back to work for the day. Of course, we'll be tweeting during today's webinar using the hashtag driving for work. I would like to welcome you all to join on that online discussion, but do tweet your responses from today's webinar using the hashtag driving for work. So now our first presentation is from Bel Velma Burns from the Road Safety Authority. Velma will be covering at the topic like commercial vehicles, a collision profile and an overview of dangerous behaviours. Over to you Velma. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of light commercial vehicles involved in collisions. I'll provide you with a collision profile based on Irish road traffic collision data, and I'll also give you an overview of dangerous behaviours. 
In terms of my presentation, I'm going to start by giving you the context just to set the scene in terms of Ireland's strategic approach to road safety. Then I'll move on and look at fatal and serious injury collisions involving light commercial vehicles over a five year period from 2017 to 2021. And my last section relates to an overview of research in relation to the main contributory factors to collisions. And where I have data specifically relating to LCBs, I will provide you with that. So here we're looking at the long term trend um, in relation to fatalities on Irish roads, starting back in 1998, where there were 458 road traffic fatalities on Irish roads. And more recently, in 2021, there were 137. So this shows that the strategic approach to road safety does work. We have been very um, successful in reducing road traffic fatalities on Irish roads since our first government road safety strategy in 1998. 2018 was our safest year on record with 135 road traffic fatalities. And while we have made good progress in reducing deaths on our roads, we are by no means complacent and we are all, always very mindful of Norway, for example, who has been particularly successful in this area and has reduced deaths to 20 deaths per million um, as of last year. Whereas Ireland, based on the latest data, we're at 27 deaths per million population. So some way to go to get where we really want to be. So here, just um, reminding you of Ireland's um, latest government road safety strategy, our journey towards Vision Zero. And this sets out um, our commitments to improve road safety over the next decade. Um, we are committed to achieving Vision Zero by 2050. And we also have very ambitious targets for the reduction in deaths and serious injuries by 2030. We aim to reduce deaths by 50% by 2030 and also to reduce serious injuries by 50% by 2030. And this visual provides an overview, just an illustration of the main components of our government road safety strategy. And this includes three action plans over three successive phases over that 10 year period. And the current action plan that we're working with runs from 2021 to 2024. It has 50 high impact actions and um, a significant number of support actions also. And this work is what will enable us to reach our targets by 2030. I'd like to point out the seven um, boxes that you can see in the middle of the slide there, and they relate to the seven priority intervention areas which frame our strategic approach to road safety up to the end of uh, 2030. And Safe work related uh, road use is a key component of our strategic approach and this is the first time that we really called out a specific priority intervention area um, in the strategy in relation to safe work related road use. So now I'm going to give you an overview of the available data from um, the Irish Road Traffic Collision Database which we receive from Angor the Siakona from their Pulse Database. So here we're going to be looking at um, uh, light, light goods vehicles or, or LCVs and just to point out um, this is how we define them in, in the road traffic collision uh, database. They are goods vehicles with a gross vehicle weight of less than two tonnes, so that's under 2,000 kilograms, so that's a van or a goods vehicle which is less than two tonnes unladen. So in this analysis, we're going to look at fatal and serious injury collision data for 2017 to 2021. And this focuses on, on fatal and serious injury collisions involve, involving an LGV where the driver's trip purpose was work related. And that can be that the driver was either commuting to or from work or they were driving for work. The driver of the vehicle may have been fatally injured, seriously injured, minorly injured, or indeed not injured at all in these collisions. So at an overall level, we had 49 fatal collisions and 354 uh, serious injury collisions involving an LGV where the driver's trip purpose was work related. 
And at an overall level, this re represents 7% of all fatal collisions over the, that five year time period and 6% of all serious injury collisions over that time period. So certainly not an insignificant proportion of collisions in the overall picture. So now let's look at the time of day where these collisions occurred. So here we're looking at fatal collisions in red, uh, serious injury collisions in teal, and the total, all fatal and serious, in the dark grey colour. And what we can see here is that the vast majority of these collisions are occurring across the working day from 8am right up to 8pm. So perhaps no surprises there in relation to typical work and travel patterns for this type of vehicle. We see a small proportion of these collisions occurring um, in the early hours of the morning and late at night. Here we're looking at uh, the spread of the occurrence of these collisions across the days of the week, Monday to Sunday. And again, perhaps no surprises here, we're seeing the vast majority of these collisions occurring across Monday to Friday, with just a small proportion of those collisions occurring at the weekend, Saturday to Sunday. And here we're looking at the month of year where the collisions um, have occurred. Uh, somewhat different pattern for fatal and serious injury collisions here. So the fatal collisions are broadly spread. The numbers are quite small, thankfully. But they're broadly spread across the year. Uh, whereas when we look at the serious injury collisions, we are seeing quite a marked pattern where there are uh, there's a higher proportion of serious injury collisions occurring in, in the winter months from September through to December. So here now we're looking at where these collisions are occurring in terms of are they occurring on urban roads or are they on rural roads? And we define an urban road as a road with a speed limit of 60 kilometers or less and a rural road um, as a road, a higher speed road with a speed limit of 80 kilometers or more. So here we're seeing that um, a significantly greater share of the fatal collisions are in fact occurring on those higher speed roads with a speed limit of 80 kilometres and above. And indeed that mirrors the general pattern that we see for all collisions, uh, all fatal collisions on Irish roads. For serious injury collisions, the picture is somewhat different. Um, the slightly more than half of these are occurring on, on urban roads. So unfortunately, we don't have very detailed information from the collision database as to the main contributory factors to these road traffic uh, fatalities and serious injuries. So we tend to rely on other research sources to give us um, a good understanding of the main contributory factors. So I'll take you through some, some of the available Irish data that we have. And the first theme that I'm going to look at is alcohol and drugs. And the first source of data I'm going to look at is the Driver Attitudes and Behaviour Survey. And this is a survey that we last completed in 2021. It's um, a very robust survey with over a thousand motorists. It was conducted online. It was nationally representative um, with a broad spread of gender, age, region and social grade. And in this survey, 9% um, of drivers surveyed admitted that they drove after consuming alcohol in the past 12 months. And this is broadly in line with historic results we've seen because we tend to track these behaviours annually, year on year in these surveys. But when we look specifically at those who say that they drive as part of their work, we saw an even higher level of self-report engagement in drink driving. And this, of course, is quite concerning. So 14% of those who say that they drive for work um, admitted that they drove after consuming alcohol in the past 12 months. The next source of data I look at is the coronial data. And this provides us with a really rich data um, in relation to the definitive contributory factors to road traffic fatalities. We received this data from the Health Research Board following the completion of the Garda in investigation and the coroner's inquest. And what this data has shown us is that 37% of driver fatalities with the toxicology result available had a positive toxicology for alcohol. And that's over the period 
2014 to 2018. Now, how we define a positive toxicology for alcohol here is blood alcohol level greater than 20 milligrams of alcohol per 100 mils of blood, because research shows that at that level, which is below the legal threshold, um, a driver will be impaired. So very uh, significant levels of, of positive toxicology in, in this data. We don't have this specifically for LCP drivers, just, just to note that. 10% had a positive toxicology for cocaine and 6% had a positive toxicology uh, for cannabis. So this shows the really significant role that alcohol and drugs plays in road traffic collisions. And I think as employers, it's really important to be aware of that. Now we're looking at speed. So we have a huge wealth of data um, in relation to speed, both, both in Ireland and internationally. But just to give you a flavor here of some of the statistics, so again, from our driver attitudes and behavior study, we know that 32% of drivers report exceeding 50k speed limits by greater than 10 kilometers at least sometimes. 27% report exceeding 100k speed limits by greater than 10k at least sometimes. Looking at the coronial data, again, from the Health Research Board, we saw that during 2014 to 2018, one in four, so 24% of driver fatalities with a record of their actions available were exceeding a safe speed. We also conduct uh, free speed surveys. And in the most recent study that we did in 2021, and the data was collected um, using um, automatic uh, traffic counter data, we saw that 78% of drivers observed were driving above the speed limit in 50k zones. And at weekends, this was even higher at 93% of drivers driving above the speed limit. So really quite concerning findings there. We don't have a breakdown by vehicle type for this study as yet, but that will come in, in the future. Um, prior to this 2021 survey, we used to do this free speed survey where we had observers at the side of the road with a handheld speed gun. And the results of that can be seen here. 27% of car drivers on rural roads broke the speed limit, but that rose to 52% of car drivers on urban roads who broke the speed limit. Now, we do have a breakdown here by different vehicle types. And what's clear here is that for other vehicles, the level of non-compliance is higher, particularly if you look at urban roads here on the left-hand side, 58% of all uh, rigid trucks were speeding, 72% of articulated trucks and 68% of single-decker buses were speeding on urban roads. Now, in relation to mobile phone use, this is really difficult to measure in collision data, um, but we tend to rely on international research, uh, such as the statistic provided here by the World Health Organization. So drivers using a mobile phone are four times more likely to be involved in a collision. We have some good Irish data also from the same self-report survey, the Driver Attitudes and Behaviour Survey, and 23% of driver, drivers surveyed reported checking phone notifications while driving, at least sometimes. 19% of drivers reported reading messages or emails, at least sometimes, and 12% reported checking social media. Now, we do have some data in relation to those who drive for work, and I'll show that now. So here we're looking at the same questions, but we're looking at, um, at those who engage in all of these behaviours that you can see on the left um, much more frequently. So those who check their phone notifications often or always, for example, for the total sample, that's at 10 percent. But if you look over on the far right, those who drive for work um, are much more likely to engage in that dangerous behaviour while driving, 17%. And indeed, that's true for all of these behaviours. Those who drive for work are more likely to use their phone in any capacity while driving. And that um, absolutely increases the crash risk. So this is something that all employers need to be very, very mindful of. Uh, my last slide um, in relation to dangerous behaviours. Fatigue, again, a very difficult one to measure in collision data, but fatigue is estimated to play a role in up to 20% of road traffic collisions and is associated with increased crash risk. 
24% of car drivers surveyed in Ireland have driven while they were so sleepy that they had trouble keeping their eyes open in the last 30 days. That comes from an, a European wide survey. So we're a little higher than the average there, which is 20% across Europe. In our drive Irish study, driver attitudes survey again, 24% of drivers surveyed have ever fallen asleep or nodded off, even if only for a brief moment while driving. Again, unfortunately, we are seeing a higher incidence of this among those who drive for work. So this rises to 30% among those who drive for work. So again, critical for employers to be aware of this and for aware, to be aware of shift, pat shift patterns and long driving hours. So in summary, um, I'd like to just say that work related road safety is a critical component of the government road safety strategy 2021 to 2030, as we saw. Survey data indicates that those who drive for work are more likely to engage in dangerous behaviours, and this must be addressed. LCDs were involved in 7% of fatal and 6% of serious injury collisions over the five year period to 2021, and these are most likely to occur midweek from 8 am to 8 pm and in winter months. While fatal collisions are more likely to occur, to occur on higher speed roads, serious injury collisions are more prevalent on urban roads. And finally, employers and road safety strategy stakeholders alike have a key role to play in building road safety awareness in the context of driving for work. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Velma. I'm sure our attendees will agree there was a lot to be taken from that presentation. I'd like to remind everyone again just to save your questions for our speakers and our Q&A at the end of today's event. We're now going to hear from Justin Martin from the Road Safety Authority, who's going to be speaking on light commercial vehicles and providing us all with an overview on compliance. Justin. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2022 Driving for Work Seminar. Um, my name is Justin Martin and I head up the enforcement team within the Road Safety Authority. And today I'd like to speak to you about light commercial vehicles. There's a couple of things that my presentation is going to cover today. One is an overview of our enforcement activity um, as regards light commercial vehicles, uh, what we find when we inspect them at the roadside, so the compliance picture. Um, what happens when we un uncover non-compliance at the roadside. Some recommendations for you as operators of LCVs, be that small, medium or large fleets of LCVs. Um, and I want to mention two EU mobility package changes that are coming our way that are going to impact LCV operators. So to discuss our enforcement activity, the first thing to say, I suppose, is when we work at the roadside inspecting commercial vehicles, we do so in partnership with a Garda Síochána. So we can't inspect vehicles without them. Uh, they stop vehicles on our behalf, and then we subsequently do a, an inspection. Um, all our vehicle inspectors are qualified mechanics, um, and they also act as witnesses to, to a Garda Síochána if we're taking a prosecution due to the nature of the severity of defects that we find at the roadside. Our vehicle inspectors also do premises inspections, so they do follow up at premises following a roadside encounter, for example. We also do random premises inspections um, and we do quality assessments of our outsourced contractor, the EA, who do those premises inspections on our behalf. And we respond to technical queries. So in terms of the numbers, um, you'll see there I presented numbers for the year 2021 and 2022 year to date. Uh, so far this year, we're doing quite well. We've managed to match what we did last year. Um, and you'll see where LCVs fit in. They, they represent about 5% of the total vehicles we inspect on an annual basis. And the more resources we get in the enforcement side, the better able we will be to increase that figure. But typically, the majority of what we do is on uh, heavy commercial vehicles. But for, any, for all intents and purposes, nearly 1,000 LCVs by the end of this year is a fair representative sample about the state of the LCV fleet. We also have transport officers who inspect vehicles for, inspect drivers for compliance with the driving and resting time rules, driver CPC and operator licensing. And I've just included this here for completeness because um, later on in the presentation, I'll be talking to you about two new requirements that are coming the way for LCV operators. And 
one will be relating to compliance with driving and resting time rules. So we do about 3,000, 3,000 to 4,000 of these type of inspections on an annual basis um, between buses and HCVs. The majority is HCVs, the vast majority. Um, you, you will see as well that um, we take court prosecution. So we don't rely on a guard shikana when we do these types of inspections. Our transport officers, they initiate their own cases um, uh, in court. So um, if we move on to the next slide, you'll see just apologies for all the numbers, but just where LCVs fit. And I've gone back a couple of years, um, both at the roadside and at the CVRT test. So at the roadside, LCVs comprise, it's risen from 2018 at about 3% up to where we are year to date, around 5% of the total vehicles inspected. Compliance rates for LCVs in or around 40, 44%. Um, gradual increase since 2018. Uh, HCV compliance rate is that bit higher at 51%. And that's pre predominantly due to the fact that our focus here to four has been on HCV operators and HCV vehicles, so both at the premises and at the roadside. But that's going to change in the coming years as we um, also make a, a concerted effort to inspect LCVs. Uh, from a CVRT testing side, uh, you'll see that there's over 400,000 LCVs tested at the CVRT network. So that's the annual roadworthiness test on an annual basis. First time pass rates is in around 62%, 60%. Whereas for a HCV, it's 74%. So again, you know, compliance amongst the LCV vehicles in the fleet is that bit less than HCVs, which is sort of driving an effort here within the RSA and our colleagues in Cardiff Econa to increase our activity targeting LCVs at the roadside. So we move on. Um, I want to talk a bit about the compliance picture um, and the findings and what we find at the roadside. So a lot of what we find at the roadside, what's interesting is that it, it's all preventable. Like there's no need for vehicles to be going on the road with the types of defects that we uncover, provided their operators have the right systems in place. So the majority of what we found on the LCV fleet in 2022 and the same in 2021 uh, are tire related issues with LCVs, followed by lighting related problems. Uh, and this, all, all of these types of defects can be sorted out if drivers are doing their walk around checks properly and reporting the defects. And then the important step is that the operator is going that extra bit and getting the defects rectified before the vehicle is used. So uh, tire related followed by lighting related defects are the main ones, uh, followed by stuff related to chassis and chassis attachments, corrosion, and then we have condition of glass, be broken mirrors, they are the top 10 types, okay? Stop lamps is one I should draw your attention to because sometimes we encounter vehicles with no stop lamps working, so no brake lights. So you might think that's pretty innocuous, but no brake lights is considered a dangerous defect um, at the roadside. So it's, it's at the upper end of the scale because obviously vehicles approaching from the rear don't have the for, for advanced warning that vehicle is slowing down. Um, I've included some photos. So on the tire side, you can see there's photos there of tires that our vehicle inspectors would have come across at the roadside, just you know, excessively worn. You know, a tire didn't get like that just one morning. You know, that happened over a period of time. So it's basically evidence of the fact that the driver of that vehicle wasn't doing any walk around checks and the operator wasn't doing periodic safety inspections and there was no action being taken, et cetera. The same with the tire on the right hand side and all our officers carry calibrated tire gauges because obviously uh, members of a Shia could be issuing, will do issue fixed penalty notices on a recommendation of our officers at the roadside where they uncover tires like the types or the, the, in the condition that you see on the screen in front of you there. Um, lighting related defects, well, there's a picture there of a Jeep on the left hand side that was uh, discovered at a roadside check with a, a light cluster on the rear right hand side missing completely. Um, trailers then is another common one with no lights. Again, you know, there's no excuse for this um, and it can be avoided if the right preparations are made to vehicles before they go on the public road. Corrosion related ones, these are more difficult to see, but again, if operators have proper preventative maintenance systems in place, 
vehicles should undergo inspections at certain time periods, eight, 10 or 12 weeks, depending on how they're being used, et cetera. Uh, and this sort of stuff should be spotted by a qualified, soon to be qualified individual before it gets to the point of being discovered at the roadside in a condition like that, which is dangerous and would involve the vehicle being, being impounded or, 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 or towed away from the roadside and delays to uh, the driver and the delays to the customers in respect of whatever goods might be uh, on the vehicle when it's stopped, et cetera. Uh, visibility, this one was another one our officers encountered recently where windscreen was cracked to the extent that you know moisture had ingressed to the interior of the vehicle and fogged up the windscreen. And you'll see that's one of our officers standing on the top right hand side in the yellow of the, of, of the photo. Um, it's difficult, you know, from the driver's seat to actually the you know, visibility is impaired, you know. So again, you know, vehicles should not be let out in a public road in a condition like that, you know, should be repaired. It's a danger to, to everybody, especially vulnerable road users like our officer seen on the right hand side, pedestrian, uh, could be cyclists, you know, et cetera, or a motorcyclist. You know, every every little bit of, of visibility, you know, when roads are as busy as they are, helps. Um, this one, it's kind of hard to know what to say about this. <laughs> Other than to say, you know, uh, uh, people are drawing attention to themselves by taking vehicles in this sort of condition out onto the public road. Um, you know, our officers would be potentially going to checkpoints or waiting for another checkpoint to happen. Um, and vehicles like this would approach or they'd observe vehicles like this parked in locations. So on the left-hand side, we'd see, you know, a gate strapped to the back of a vehicle, which clearly was never intended to be that way. And 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 just, look, I suppose, is it, it looks like drivers, you know, they're taking unnecessary risks. On the right-hand side there, you'll see, trailer being used where the middle, the, wheel, the tires or the wheels of the middle axle, both sides uh, are, are have been removed for whatever reason or not fitted. So, you know, visually when you see vehicles like that at the roadside, you're drawing attention to yourselves. Um, and it will, will you know, and Gerd Shikhan had no choice then but to do an inspection and a look at tires and check tax and insurance and licensing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and our officers will do a, 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 a check on the maintenance condition of the vehicle. You know, and that causes delays, um, delays to the drivers, delays to, you know, uh, customers receiving goods, et cetera, would be that farmers or, or whatever. So, so I suppose my advice would be is, you know, don't take on any unnecessary risks like the types that are shown in, in, in the photos here, here on this screen, because you're drawing attention to yourselves and it's only going to end up with delays. Somebody, if you're not encountered a roadside check, someone will most likely has a video camera on their phone and will report you. Um, in terms of the types of defects we find on the roadside and what we can actually do with them, you know, the consequences for non-compliance range from being fairly minor to the more serious. So being minor would be vehicles being, being ordered to be repaired on site. So we catch a vehicle at the roadside, it's in a, has defects present, they could be in any category, minor, major, or dangerous. If they're at the lower end of the scale, uh, vehicles can be repaired on site. A lot of times that's to do with, might be getting tires replaced. So you'd have to call a mobile tire service um, uh, uh, van to come visit, visit the vehicle at the roadside, which is expensive. And it's nearly more than the penalty itself to get the tire replaced, but represents delays to the driver, et cetera. Um, our officers can also request evidence of repairs. So they could give you 10 days, depending on the type of defect and how severe it was, to provide proof that it had been fixed. For more serious ones, the vehicle will be prohibited from continuing on its journey, or on Garda Shikana may impound the vehicle to one of their detention facilities and have a PSV inspector examine it, examine it with a view to taking court prosecution. Um, vehicles could also be taken to a CVRT centre for what's known as an enforcement test, so where equipment might be needed to verify whether braking systems or lighting systems are working correctly, et cetera, would be sent to a CVRT center. Um, our officers might recommend in, 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 in bad or more serious cases that Gardaí Chicana issue fixed charge penalty notices, particularly for tires, or uh, a formal court prosecution. And if you are taken to court for a defective vehicle, it'll be at the discretion of the judge what the fine is, but the max would be at 5,000 euros. Um, 
and or up to six months in prison. That's for breach of the, the roadside enforcement regulations that our officers currently enforce. Um, so what are my recommendations for you as operators, um, owners, operators, drivers of light commercial vehicles? There's a few simple steps we can take. Um, the first one is that you need to ensure your vehicles are roadworthy. There's a legal requirement to do that. So where there are defects, uh, they need to be fixed before vehicles are used. Uh, but they can't be fixed if you don't know about them. So therefore, drivers need to be trained on how to do their walk-around checks, and there has to be a system in place to report their defects. And then a competent person has to review those defects and then you know, organize to have the vehicle repaired before its use or put back into service. We also recommend, obviously, that vehicles are tested on time. Uh, we implement a system. So what tested means like the CVRT test that they're presented on time uh, and that operators implement a system for regular inspection and maintenance of vehicles. So there's two types of inspections. You have the driver to do the walk around check and then there are periodic safety inspections that need to be done by a competent person, which has regard to the condition of the vehicle, the age, the mileage, any manufacturer's guidelines, et cetera. And those systems need to be reviewed periodically and made, made changes made to ensure they're effective. Also, those periodic safety inspections need to be carried out by suitably qualified personnel. So people who know what they're doing as regards examining vehicles from a maintenance perspective and have the tools and equipment and the facilities necessary to do so safely. Um, I've mentioned about drivers being trained to do walk around checks uh, and defects getting repaired. Another important one would be that every vehicle should have a file, be it electronic or paper, that keeps a record of you know, what walk around checks have, have taken place, where defects have been reported from the walk around checks, the results of the periodic safety inspections, the results of the CVRT test, um, invoices from components that were used in repair, et cetera, so that when we go to do premises audits, from a maintenance and, and, and repair perspective, that vehicles have files and it's easy to see on a particular vehicle uh, that the operator is keeping on top of the maintenance requirements because they've got a system in place, the paperwork matches the condition of the vehicle as might have been found out in the yard or on the roadside, et cetera. And finally, um, there's an, uh, uh, an obligation for operators for heavy commercial vehicles only to make a declaration to um, the RSA. So some of you may be operating mixed fleets and have both. Uh, and you'll know about that. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, there are two changes I just want to flag with you regarding LCVs that are probably going to be new for a lot of you. Um, and they arise from the EU's mobility package. Um, and one involves operator licensing, believe it or not. So you'll know if you carry goods in a HGV for hire and reward that you must have an operator's license. The same applies to LCVs, so light commercial vehicles, since May 2022, if those vehicles are being used on international journeys for hire and reward. And our colleagues in the Department of Transport's Road Haulage Operator License Division have set up a system uh, for operators to be able to apply for licenses and have LCVs with a maximum, it applies to LCVs with a maximum authorized mass of 2.5 tonnes or greater. Uh, that need to be stated on the license if they're being used on international journeys for hire and reward. So it doesn't apply to national only uh, or it doesn't apply to interna international for own account. But if you're using your LCV for hire and reward on international journeys, uh, then since May 2022, there is a legal obligation for you to have that stated on operator's license to vehicle. The second one in stems on from the first, I suppose, is that the drivers of those LCVs uh, are going to have to start complying with the driving and resting time rules from July 2026. The regulation there is EU regulation 2020-1054, which requires LCVs, again, used on international journeys that have a design for a maximum authorised mass of greater than two and a half tonnes. So from July 2026, those vehicles will be required to be fitted with a tachograph, which means drivers have to comply with the driving and resting time rules. And I have a summary of them there. So 45 minutes break after four and a half hours of driving can be split between a 15 and a, and a 30 minute. Um, uh, 
daily driving limited to nine hours, weekly limited to 56 hours, 11 hours rest. These are just the, the summary of the, of the main rules. 11 hours rest in every 24 hour period uh, and a weekly rest of 45 hours to be taken after six 24 hour periods. Those of you obviously who operate uh, heavy commercial vehicles or have a mix in your fleets will be well familiar with, those, with these rules. So I suppose those rules would be what drivers have to comply with, but there are also going to be a suite of rules then that the operator, by virtue of the fact that if they're using LCVs on international journeys, the operator and their, those vehicles need to be fitted with tack graphs, et cetera. The operator has certain obligations and I've summarized them on the next slide. So, you know, operators will need to ensure that drivers have a digital tack graph card, only one and only use one card. You know, we see a lot of people using multiple cards, which is fraud, um, and it's very easily detectable at the roadside. And are quite stiff penalties will involve a day in court for both the driver and the operator. So, so you know, there's an obligation there for the, the, the operator to know that the driver has a card and is using only their own card. The TAC graph equipment is working and it's calibrated. Um, the drivers know how to use the TAC graph equipment, that they know to use the mode switch. So when their vehicles are um, at rest, you know, that they put it on rest or when they're doing other work, etc. cetera, um, that the, as an operator, you're doing the downloads of the TAC graph. So not only is it HCVs will be downloaded, but it'll be any LCV vehicles in your fleet on doing international journeys. Um, that drivers can, uh, you know, that you'd be asking drivers to produce records of other work that they've done, maybe at weekends or at nighttime. So you know, you know, if there's other driving or the impact, impacts on working time, etc. cetera. Um, if rules are broken, that you take steps to, to, to rectify the situation and document remedial actions. Like we do appreciate sometimes drivers make mistakes, but when we come and do premises inspections and we notify, we notice, notice infringements when we're looking at records, you know, oftentimes like the good operators will have a, a documented reason as to why that happened and which is fine. And then, you know, once off that's fine, but it's only if we see patterns that we might go down the route of official warning or, or a worst case scenario prosecution. And the final thing that operators need to ensure is is that journeys are planned. So journeys driven by LCVs or in LCVs by drivers of Category B licenses will need to be planned like for HCV to take account of traffic congestion, road works, you know, daily living requirements, et cetera, to ensure that drivers can comply with the driving and resting time rules. So to recap, you know, I have six points here, which I'd like you to take away from today's presentation. The first thing is, um, no matter what type of vehicle it is, but considering this presentation, I suppose, is, was geared towards an LCV audience, the vehicle must be maintained. Drivers must be trained how to do the walk-around checks. And as an operator, you're obliged to put a system in place for periodic maintenance inspections and ensure that defects get repaired before vehicles go on the road. The second thing is vehicles need to be tested on time at the CVRT network. There are no capacity issues like we're currently seeing at the NCT site. Um, so vehicles need to be tested on time. And another important thing is that when they're tested and a disc is, is posted out, that the disc is displayed. You know, oftentimes when guards stop vehicles at the roadside, you know, they're trying to look at a lot of things going on and protect their own health and safety. And they need to see that the discs are in date in the dashboard. Um, and it's no use having a, a, the latest disc uh, stuck in, 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 in the office when the vehicle has passed its test. It needs to be on display and there's a legal requirement to do it. It helps us from an enforcement perspective and it will minimize delays to you at the roadside. So, so that would be my advice is, you know, make sure the discs are displayed. Uh, again, review maintenance systems periodically and ensure if you have LCV vehicles doing international journeys that you get them stated on an operator's license and you prepare for the introduction of tachographs uh, and put those systems in place from July 2026 onwards. Um, I hope you found this pre short presentation useful. We have plenty of resources available on the drivingforwork.ie website uh, where you'll see a copy of this presentation in due course. Um, and we've recorded a podcast for last year's edition. There are other resources that will be available to you should you find it useful. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening. Um, goodbye. And I look forward to uh, receiving your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Justin, for that really insightful presentation. 
a lot of information there for everybody to take on board, but I'm sure you'll agree it was really interesting to hear what um, our colleagues in the Road Safety Authority see when they're out on the roads. So now what we're going to, we're going to hear from um, Inspector Ross O'Doherty from Angarda Siakana. He's going to bring us through um, some of the behaviours the guards see when they're on our roads. For example, um, again, dangerous behaviours, unsecure loads and poor decision making that drivers make. Ross. Hello, Ross O'Doherty is my name. I'm an inspector attached to the Garda National Roads Policing Bureau. We're in Garda headquarters in the Phoenix Park there. And Garda Shia Connor are delighted to be taking part in this webinar this morning. And we look forward to listening to the uh, submissions from other people involved. We'd also like to acknowledge the work that's been put into organising the event today. We and I would like to also acknowledge the partners, working partnerships we have with both the RSA and the HSA and other relevant stakeholders in relation to road safety. And we look forward to building on and continuing those working partnerships going into the future so we can achieve our common goals, which is making our roads, communities and workplaces safe. My presentation today is going to obviously focus on the Garda aspect of um, road safety and driving for work. And I'm going to discuss the four key offences that we believe are the main contributors, that we know are the main contributors to fatal and serious road traffic collisions. And I hope that you'll be able to take away a few key learnings from this and hopefully be able to change practices in your workplace. Now, to start off, unfortunately, there have been, there has since been 130, since these figures were put together, there's been 130 fatalities on our roads year to date. And there was a huge increase of 11% when you look back at figures in 2019 and 2021. Um, every single one of those numbers is a life lost and it has wider impacts among the family and friends and colleagues of the deceased person. So we take each one of them very seriously. And it's a number that we don't, that we work very hard in a guard sheet account to try to get down. We've been working on that with our colleagues in the RSA as well in relation to our media messaging and getting trying to change driver behavior. Um, we do have a collective responsibility on the roads and we share the roads and the responsibility for safety on our roads. So we have to look out for one another, each one another um, as we go about our daily business using the road network in the country. On the right hand column there, you will see that 75 of the fatalities year to date have been either the driver or passenger in a vehicle. What's also concerning is that 40% of the figures there are, are what we call vulnerable road users. That is pedestrians, pedal cyclists and motorcyclists. We do need to look out for them more so than ever because they do not have the protections of a car. In the event of any collision, they will be most likely um, seriously injured or indeed fatally injured as a result of that collision with a vehicle. The four key offences that I want to talk about today are intoxicated driving, that's driving under the influence and or al of alcohol and or drugs, non-wearing of a safety belt, using a mobile phone while driving and speeding. These key, as I said, these key offences are what contribute to serious and fatal road traffic collisions. So intoxicated driving, the instance of intoxicated driving has increased by 10% in the previous 12 months. There were 641 incidents of driving while intoxicated in September 22 alone, and that's an average of 150 drivers arrested each week in September. Some of those drivers would have been caught at mandatory intoxicant checkpoints. We've had over 4,200 in the month of September. That's when the Gardaí stop vehicles at the side of the road and test for drugs and alcohol. Um, and what's important to note, particularly when you're thinking of a work-related environment, is specified drivers a specified driver is generally a learner, novice driver, or a commercial or professional driver. So you will have a lot of them. If people are driving for work, they will be in your workforce and they will have a lower limit when it comes to blood alcohol in their blood, urine, or breath. It is roughly about 50% the allowance that a regular a person driving a, their private vehicle would have. For example, um, blood would be 50 micrograms of alcohol per 100 milliliters of breath. For a specified driver, it goes down to 20 uh, milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of breath. So it is a significant drop, and that works the same for urine and breath as well. Um, we'd also appeal now to you would be to consider the morning after. Um, so just because somebody has a few hours sleep after a night out does not mean that all the alcohol has left their system. 
And we'd appeal now, especially coming up to the Christmas period, when planning Christmas parties or social events that you consider the morning after. And we would not like to see a situation emerge where people are organizing Christmas parties and the next day is a working day where people are expected to drive to or drive for work. And they would also have pressure of attending the social event, which could finish in the early hours of the morning. So we would be appealed to take into account the morning after when planning these events, try to do so when the next day is not a work day. Um, in relation to seat, seat belts, the safety belt is the most basic form of road safety. On average, about 500 people are detected without a safety belt each month. That is a huge number, considering how easy it is to put on. Over one third of fatalities in vehicles have no safety belt on at the time of the collision. And we also ask why people fail to wear one. Um, from my own experience operationally, I did encounter a few times where people had the seatbelt put on behind them in order to cancel out the safety audible device inside the vehicle. You know, and the excuse I was provided at the time was that they were required to jump in and out of the van constantly during the day and they couldn't be putting their seatbelt on and off. Again, that excuse is not good enough and it could lead to a fatality or serious injury in that collision. So therefore, penalty points would have issued in that time. Since then, penalty points have increased and so has the fine. So the fine is now 120 euro and three penalty points. And this was one of a number of offences that increased in October 22 to try to drive home this message that the wearing of safe belts is mandatory and will save your life. The Gardaí do not want to be stopping people for these offences, but where we do detect them, they are lifesaver offences. We will step in and we will be proactive in enforcing the wearing of these um, of these offences and particularly the wearing of seatbelts. Um, mobile phones, using a mobile phone while driving makes you four times more likely to crash. Driver distraction plays a role in about 20 to 30% of all road collisions. Over 1,700 drivers detected each holding a mobile phone each month. So again, these are huge numbers. And when you consider the, that the distraction plays 20 to 30% 30 of all road collisions, it's, uh, it's quite concerning. While mobile phones are not new devices, the way they are being used has changed. The phone is kind of the secondary part of these devices now. And a lot of people tend to check social media regularly and other apps. So we'd be appealing to employers and employees. Firstly, for employers, do not can contact your employees while they're driving, unless it's absolutely necessary to do so. And if it is necessary, make sure you only contact them if there is a Bluetooth um, device inside in the vehicle that they are driving. Otherwise, it's not important. Wait till they're back in the depot or the office. Likewise, employees do not check your phone while driving and do not make unnecessary calls while driving. The best advice I could give would be to put the phone out of reach into the back of the vehicle where the temptation to check it is not there and have it connected to still to your Bluetooth device so you can take urgent calls if needed. I would encourage you that if it is a serious call, pull in, take your time and deal with it then. Do not be getting stressed out while you're driving or do anything which will take your focus away from the road. Speeding. Speeding is uh, one of the biggest killers on our roads. I think we all know that. Uh, a 1% reduction in average speed results in a 4% reduction in fatal collisions. Now, there's been over 14,000 drivers detected speeding every single month. And I'll go into the detection methods in the next slide. But we know that an increase in average speed is directly related to the likelihood of a crash occurring and the severity of the consequences of that crash. So the laws of physics apply there. The faster the speed, the more damage that's going to be done when that speed is brought to a sudden halt. And unfortunately, the human body will lose that battle every single time. So we would appeal to everyone to slow down, particularly um, when driving heavier vehicles, as the braking distance is extended. We would also ask you to be cognizant of vulnerable road users. Give them a 1.5 meter minimum. That's the minimum. You can give them three meters and it's safe to do so. Give them three meters. Or indeed, if you have to stop and wait for it to be safe to overtake, do so then. Do not breach the 1.5 meter minimum rule. As we can see from the first slide there, there is a significant number of vulnerable road users who are um, killed on our roads each year. Some of you may be aware of the introduction of the average speed detection system on the M7 there, that is near the Bird Hill Junction. And again, that is a, it's been piloted there and it's expected to be rolled out nationwide on our motorway network. And to give you an example, in that particular location, it is changing driver behavior. 
So on an average, most recent figures I've seen was that three out of four detections for every 1,000 journeys. So it is quite minimal. Um, it's bringing the slow speed down and we're quite happy to see those numbers come in. Um, also, your variable speed limits are now enforced on the M50, those who use that. And you would see it, that's brought in where the overhead gantries show a speed limit for a certain time of the day. So if there's inclement weather, traffic congestion or a collision ahead, the allotment speed to speed has been lowered from the 100 kilometers per hour, which the majority of the M50 is. So those speed limits will be enforced by the Gardaí and I'd anticipate with the assistance of technology uh, in the near future. It is something to be cognizant of that the speed limits on those countries do apply on the road at a time and they are enforceable. And the final message on speeding would be that being late for a meeting or appointment will not kill you, but speeding to get you there might kill you, a pedestrian or another road user. In relation to how we enforce the speed limits on our roads, there are two ways of doing so. That's intercept, and that's when the guardy at the in your top right picture there is at the side of the road, detects you with a speed measuring device, pulls you in and issues the ticket to the driver at the side of the road. The other method is a non-intercept, which is our safety cameras, currently operated by GoSafe, pictured down the bottom left. And of course, the new variable speed or the average speed limit cameras. We have, in relation to the mobile safety cameras, there's almost 1,400 locations nationwide. And these are in locations where there is a history of serious or fatal crashes or indeed dangerous road behavior report to us. Um, there are no secret where they are. We publish them on our website. Anyone who drives the roads knows exactly where they're going to be parked and they're quite high visible. What's encouraging is, and some of you may have noticed this from our recent bank holiday operation, when we published our stats on our social media channels, channels is that there is generally a 99.5% compliance rate where these vans are located. So the amount of people, the driver behavior is changing when on these roads, they're expecting the speed van to be there and uh, the speed is in turn lowering with that. Um, so sorry, the key messages for employees to take away to stay at the right speed would be to check your speedometer regularly, especially when leaving high speed roads, know the limits, look for signs, especially at junctions. Remember speed limits are a maximum, not a target. Try to stay in a lower gear in lower speed limit areas. Lower your speed where children are about. Concentrate on your own driving. Slow down when entering villages, towns, residential areas, and drive as though a child could run out in front of the vehicle at any time. When in car parks, drive very slowly. Small children cannot see over parked cars, and likewise, you cannot see them. And give yourself plenty of time to make your journey. Plan ahead and plan for delays while you're en route to your destination. Respect to vulnerable road users, one study we looked at, we had looked at 167 fatal and serious injury collisions that involved the HGV in the period of the 1st of the 1st, 21 to 30th of the 9th, 22. Of those, 37 were fatal and 130 were serious injuries and 58 of those related to vulnerable road users being fatally or seriously injured. That was made up of 25 pedestrians 21 pedal cyclists and 12 motorcyclists. With respect to the rules of the road and how we can help protect those vulnerable road users, the messages would be to never put a cyclist or motorcyclist at risk. And we can include scooters and users in that now and know your duty to be aware of them. They are especially vulnerable if there's a crash in particular. Watch for cyclists and motorcyclists at junctions where cycle tracks merge with roads. When you change lanes, when opening your door to get over a vehicle, when stopping and turning, especially when making a left turn and when reversing. While overtaking, never cut in front of cyclists or motorcyclists. Give them plenty of space, particularly in wet weather and windy conditions, and when there's poor road surface conditions. When starting off, cyclists tend to wobble until they build up their speed, and also when the road surface is poor. Cyclists and motorcyclists may need to avoid potholes. So it's important that when you plan to overtake, you give them plenty of room, minimum of 1.5 meters, or indeed stop and wait until it's safe to do so. Um, and particularly when turning left, watch out for cyclists and motorcyclists, motorcyclists close to the curb in front of you or coming up on your left, especially if there's a cycle track on the left. Do not overtake a cyclist as you approach a junction if you are turning left, 
as that cyclist may be going straight ahead. Um, in respect of parking of vehicles, safe parking is a key element of safe driving. You cannot park a vehicle anywhere that interferes with the normal flow of traffic or obstructs or endangers road users. Be mindful of vulnerable road users and do not park on footpaths, cycle lanes and bus lanes. The message there would be to stay safe and park safe. The image on the right would be an example of one of the operation days we have throughout the calendar year, which is Operation Enable. And that's when we focus on this type of parking behavior uh, with a more intense focus on it would be your disabled bays, parking on footpaths and parking in cycle lanes. The parking on footpaths and disabled bays causes serious distress to people who already have enough hardship to deal in their lives. So there's no need and there's no reason to park up a footpath and cause that road user, and cause that vulnerable person to go out onto the road to avoid a van or car being parked on the road. Also, in terms of social media, as you can see, we blurred out that company images there and in our media messaging. We'll also blur out any identifying features. However, the members of the public will not, and you see it yourselves on social media channels when somebody detects somebody parking on a disabled bay, parking on a footpath, blocking road, vulnerable road users or cycle lanes or bus lanes, they will tag your company and put a picture up there and say, what do you like, at whoever. So when the driver gets the points or the fines, the company gets the bad press as well. So we'd encourage you all to have good parking practices in your companies and indeed the drivers among you to practice uh, good parking pretty much. Stay safe and park safe. Um, in relation to unsecured loads, a load must be positioned to maintain adequate stability, steering and braking. Use suitable restraint equipment to secure the load. Remember, loads can move forwards, backwards, or sideways and must be restrained in each of these directions. And make sure you check your load regularly during your journey to ensure that the load remains secure. We'd also ask that you train all your staff appropriately in how to um, secure their loads and check their loads. And also some good supervision before they even leave the depot to have another person check on that load, make sure it's been done correctly. It will keep people safe, including your staff. Um, I would look forward to any questions you may have on that presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that, Inspector O'Doherty. And now let me introduce Ms. Deirdre Sinnott McFeet from the Health and Safety Authority. She's going to provide us with a perspective on safe work related road use for light commercial vehicles. Thanks, Deirdre. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning to uh, talk to you about safe work related road use for light commercial vehicles and to provide a perspective from the HSA and myself about the current concerns and challenges that we see in respect of managing light commercial vehicles in a work context in Ireland. So what I will cover today is I am going to introduce safe work related road use as a concept. I will talk uh, in some detail about van fleet risk management and, and the myriad of, of uh, I suppose, challenges within that, that space uh, and about the HSA's focus in, in relation to um, van fleet risk, risk management practices um, at the moment. I will reca recap in the course of that on um, occupational health and safety safe systems approach, as opposed to road safety um, safe systems approach, uh, and just, just make the distinction between the two. And uh, I will talk about some of the current challenges as we know them in the light commercial vehicle landscape that you may not be aware of. So hopefully we'll be able to Bring, bring to light some new information that you weren't uh, aware of. Um, I will underline risk management priorities for employers. I will talk about the action that is needed by you as employers, as managers, as duty holders, and some of the necessary measures that need to be taken to address light commercial vehicle risk management uh, to achieve safe work-related road use. And I suppose finally, we'll just reflect and uh, have a look at how we're doing. And I will ask you some pertinent questions about how you are currently managing your light commercial vehicle fleet. So the term safe work related road use is a new term for some of you. It 
is uh, one of the seven pillars in the current road safety strategy. And it would perhaps previously been referred to as work related road safety in the previous road safety strategy and in, in the policy orientations that have been ongoing for the past 10 years or so between the RSA uh, on Garda Síochána and the Health and Safety Authority in particular and, and all the, the previous work that was done in, in that space. So we are now talking specifically about safe, safe work related road use. Uh, in an effort to improve safety management of work related journeys and really the emphasis is on employers having planned safety systematic safety management of work journeys on the roads aiming to reduce the risk of death and serious injuries so it is about preventing harm and a focus on preventing harm through through systems of 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 work and Unfortunately, there, there is a reason for that. Uh, this, this approach isn't just because of what's happening in Ireland, it's because of what's happening right across uh, Europe and, and globally in respect of road safety. And in, in particular, in relation to uh, light commercial vehicles, for one year in particular, I just chose this year, 2017, uh, there were 3,220 uh, deaths uh, involving vans or light commercial vehicles. And that's a pretty staggering statistic. And the, the, the sad reality is that the majority, if not all of those deaths were preventable. Had there been appropriate systems of work in place that ensured that, the, that vehicles were safe, that drivers engaged in safe driving behavior on the roads, that journeys were safe, and that vehicle operations conducted on the road were safe. So there were ultimately system absences or system failures that led to those deaths and not the van landscape is 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 quite complex there were many types of vans in use on the roads across all work sectors each with a different purpose using the road for different reasons at different times by people with varying standards of competence and the standards of compliance vary. And this is really just a summary of the thoughts of, of ourselves and, and I would say the RSA and the guards in respect of um, the van landscape at, at present. And you're all familiar with different types of vans. And by looking at a van just at a glance, you can tell a lot about the levels of compliance normally um, and, and how it's driven. Uh, we'll also give you an indication of how well uh, uh, risk management is being managed back at, back, back at base uh, by the company. And in terms, I suppose, of, of uh, exemplifying some of the issues around uh, van, van risk management at, at present, I think this is a lovely example of that. And you, look, you may look at that picture from a distance and say, yeah, white van um, looks reasonably OK. The lights are, aren't broken. It looks clean looks in reasonably good condition at a glance. But if we, if we look a little closer at the sign on the back window, it reveals um, quite another story altogether. And it came to the attention of one of our inspectors recently uh, while out on uh, an inspection. And what that sign says is, catering van, do not open this door as it is not secure and will fall off the hinges. So if that door were to fall off the hinges, what injury do you think would be caused to the individual who unfortunately maybe didn't know about the hinges uh, not being able to hold the door in place or the fact that the hinges have not been repaired? Somebody went to a great level of, of um, effort to go and get that sign made up and to get it stuck onto that, the back of the van, but didn't think that the same level of effort and attention should have been placed on um, getting that back door of that van repaired. What if the, va the door fell off the van uh, while the van was out driving around uh, the city? This was this was in Dublin um, and this van was, you know, had had come in and parked up. So it was it was traveling around the city. So that's just one one little story of uh, the state of play with some some vans that are currently in circulation um, in, in Ireland at the moment. Here are some other other vans that have made the headlines. Uh, the, the previous one didn't actually make the headlines, but it, made, it certainly came to my attention. 
Um, others have made the headlines for different reasons on Twitter and in the national newspapers uh, for all the wrong reasons. And again, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, what ultimately went wrong to, to, to lead to these situations that luckily in these two instances did not, um, did not lead to injury. But the, the picture on the left on the Garda Twitter account relates to a van that was driving at 66 kilometers per hour in a 30 zone, which is way and above um, acceptable um, in any man's uh, terms. And the uh, image on the right is a van that somehow uh, left the road and found itself planted into somebody's front living room. Um, now, you can all surmise as to how these things happen, but at the back of it all, I have to ask the question, who is managing these people? What is the story back at the base? Uh, what sort of systems have these employers got in place and how are those systems being um, managed on a day to day basis that lead to these um, very unsafe uh, occurrences happening. And there are lots of other warning signs of, of uh, unsafe behaviour, errors and omissions by drivers. And my question is, are those warning signs being heeded? And what, what, what is happening that people are continually having minor tips, um, vehicles that are, are, don't have the brake engaged that are rolling into cars, you know, wing mirrors being knocked off, hundreds, maybe thousands of wing mirrors being knocked off uh, on a routine basis. Um, the consequences of unsafe parking um, for vulnerable road users in particular. These are all signs that the system is not set up for success, that the system is failing um, or maybe that there is no system at all in place. And unfortunately, those Minor incidents, those minor um, pieces of damage, those those minor events ultimately lead to um, major incidents that have very traumatic consequences for for people. Um, and in that regard, we're aware uh, from the previous speaker that uh, between 2017 and 2021, um, there were 49 fatal collisions and 354 serious collisions involving light commercial vehicles. And every year there are hundreds of injuries reported to the HSA in addition to that in relation to injuries sustained by people who have been working uh, in, on or around uh, light commercial vehicles, such as manual handling injuries, slips, trips and falls, and um, injuries associated with um, slow, slow maneuvers uh, in workplaces where there's tips and bumps and people get um, injuries, you know, soft tissue injuries, injuries uh, as well. So there is a lot of injury and trauma happening uh, in this space, and it is ultimately preventable uh, when the appropriate systems are in place to manage uh, risk. And the real challenge here is uh, for us to think about how to prevent work related vehicle incidents in the workplace and on the road and to make van operations take place without risk of harm to people and make sure that people get home safe at the end of the shift or working day. And in order for us to to do that, we have to reflect on why incidents are happening. And ultimately, it's because of a lack of safe systems, lack of management control. Um, in some instances, unsafe, unsuitable, unroadworthy vehicles. But there is a lack of awareness and a lack of training. And that leads to deliberate unsafe acts, errors and omissions and killer behaviours being engaged in by employees who drive for work. And what I'm asking employers to think about and urging employers to refocus their efforts on putting in place safe systems of work that set people up for success and not failure in regard to van fleet uh, operations. And there are duties on employers and employees within that safe system. And the employer is ultimately responsible for putting a framework 
in place that enables safe vehicles, safe drivers, safe operations and safe journeys at all times. Take into account of other relevant statutory provisions that must also be complied with, such as road traffic legislation and road safety legislation. But building a framework within which everyone can behave safely and experience a safe working environment and safe working day. It's not easy. There are many, many things to consider and there are many challenges associated with putting a safe system in place. And I've just outlined some of them there. Some are within your control. Some may not be directly within your control, but the things that you can control must be controlled, such as vehicle roadworthiness, such as driver behavior, such as journey management and planning, such as having procedures for deliveries and collections that take place on or near a road, such as parking rules. Vans are the workhorses of our cities and towns. We rely on them for business to get done and for goods and services to come to our workplaces and our homes. Um, and we need to better manage those processes uh, involving vans. Uh, not all vans are equal. You all in this audience will have van fleets operating for different reasons at different times and for different purposes. You need to customize your systems to meet the demands of your business um, and be, be tailored to your needs. You must also consider driver challenges, real challenges for drivers when they're out driving their van every day. Um, driver licensing requirements, work schedule demands, um, the need for instruction and training and clear, clear instructions about how drivers are expected to behave during the course of the work in a van on any given day. There are known risk factors for collisions, uh, and I've listed them here under, under driver, vehicle and journey, but I'd like to highlight some things that you really do need to focus on more than others, and that's in terms of drivers, attitudes, behaviours. Uh, poor attitudes and behaviours lead to unsafe acts occurring, and also driver fitness to drive. A huge emphasis needs to shift in the direction of fitness to drive. Um, because it's not, in the majority of cases, it's errors, omissions and unsafe acts that lead to uh, incidents occurring. Vehicle roadworthiness is one thing, but really to think about how you can uh, perhaps uh, choose vehicles that have a much higher safety rating for both drivers and occupants, such as passengers. Um, and in terms of journey management, um, really certainly a focus on um, Passenger management, uh, roadworks and how people are engaging with roadworks uh, in, in urban areas and, and otherwise, and how they're behaving within roadwork zones and uh, seasonal variations in um, risk management uh, priorities. Uh, we're coming into the winter and I suppose I have to ask yourself, are you set up appropriately to deal with winter winter driving and autumn driving conditions at the moment and, and the, the variable weather that we find ourselves uh, facing every day. So in summary, um, it's not a case of may take action. Employers must take action. There's a legal duty of care owed to employees who drive like commercial vehicles for work. And uh, this duty of care must be must be included in terms of fleet risk management. Um, when you're looking at buying new vehicles, include safety criteria within that. And I've let I've included a link here to the van safety Euro NCAP scheme, which has recently been launched. And it may enlighten you as to what safety features are available on the market in certain certain vehicles. Um, make sure vehicles are uh, compliant with uh, uh, current roadworthiness uh, requirements. Um, ensure drivers have clear rules of engagement and clear instructions on how they're expected to behave while driving for work. 
uh, journeys need to be managed um, and working hours need to be managed around those journeys. As I said before, put a focus on fitness for work, fitness to drive and make sure that uh, work patterns and shift patterns do not contribute to unsafe driver behavior or fatigue. And I suppose finally, um, I'd like you to think about how you are doing in your business. Here are a number of questions that perhaps you can reflect upon. Um, are you managing your van fleet in the same way and with the same emphasis and focus as you are managing safety within the workplace? Um, and are you tackling infringements and unsafe behaviour? And are you investigating uh, all the damage that's been done on vehicles and how it occurred and in what circumstances uh, the, the, the damage occurred? Because they are near miss incidents um, that could potentially um, be your next uh, major incident at work. And um, also look at um, rules for using uh, work vehicles outside of working time for private use, because that's that's an issue. Um, and really having a, a, an ongoing conversation in your workplace around driving for work, driving vans or light commercial vehicles for work and what the expectation is on employees as to how they should behave while conducting business on your behalf, what standards apply and what the consequences might be if they don't comply with those rules and standards. And the, the reason why we're, we're putting such a focus on this is that there is an unacceptable level of harm on our roads at the moment involving people in the course of work including people who drive like commercial vehicles and vans. And we need employers to engage fully and put in place systematic safety management of work journeys on the roads so that we reduce the number of people who are killed and injured and reduce the trauma that's associated with these horrific incidents on our roads. And action really does change things. And you have the power to change the current picture and the picture that's been outlined by the RSA and by Angarda Siakona today. So I would urge you to redouble your efforts in relation to your van fleet risk management. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. OK, everybody, I'm sure you can agree that the speakers from this morning's session have given us a real invaluable and important insights into how we can reduce the number of road accidents for those who drive for work and ultimately save lives. Following our short break, which is coming up now, we're going to have two further presentations from Irish Water and Early Quid. So the break will be until five past eleven. So we'll see you back here at five past eleven. Everybody grab a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. Thanks. See you in a few minutes. Hi everybody, welcome back. I hope you all got a chance to grab a cup of tea or a coffee before we begin the next um, part of our morning session. Now we're going to hear from Ken Clayton. He's joining us from Irish Water and Ken is going to discuss their approach to van fleet risk management. Just to remind you all, you can put your questions in in the submission box at the end of the screen. Just make sure you put the name of the presenter you'd like to direct your question to. We're getting quite a few questions in, so we might not get to them all at the end of um, today's session, but we'll do our very best. All right, it's over to you, Ken. Hello, my name is Ken Clayton. I'm one of the regional fleet managers in Irish Water. Today, I'm going to give you a presentation on how we manage van fleet risk management. So to give you a background on Irish Water, it's a semi-state company with responsibility for the delivery of water services in Ireland. The fleet team was established in 2017 and it has the responsibility for the entire Irish water fleet, which includes light commercial vehicles, heavy goods vehicles and mobile specialist equipment. To date, we have rolled out 1,059 vehicles, 813 of which are vans. So you see the chart there on the right hand side of the screen. In 2018, we had 400 vehicles. We reached 1,000 vehicle threshold um, this year back in March and we in 2025, we aim to have 1,400 vehicles in place. Just to give you an example of what we have within our van fleet, uh, we'll take you through the photographs here on the top left. We have an example of our small vans. And below that then we have a lower base medium van. 
And then in the middle, the top middle, it's one of our all-wheel drive large vans uh, with the two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive equivalent below that. And then over on the right-hand side, um, we have some of our newest vehicles, electric vans. The top right photograph shows uh, two electric vans that we delivered to the Aran Islands earlier this year. And then the below uh, uh, van on the uh, bottom right shows one of our electric medium vans, which we re recently took delivery of. So driving for work, what are the challenges? So adopting the best safety practice, keeping the fleet age as low as possible, safe storage of equipment, materials and chemicals, ensuring that we have weight compliance, Tires are above the our three millimeter replacement policy, uh, reversing fleet visibility, manual handling, water sampling. In other words, having vans that are suitably equipped for carrying all water sampling equipment, uh, telematics, ongoing safe, ongoing safety initiatives, driver behavior, speed and compliance and training. COVID then, of course, brought its own challenges in terms of fleet management, and then the clean vehicles directive. So adopting best best safe, safety practice. We have this split into um, three columns. So the vehicle, the driver, and the journey. So as per SI 348 of 2013, we would have preventive maintenance inspections in all our fleet. We have 100% CBRT compliance, and that is monitored on a bi-weekly basis with regular meetings with our fleet management provider. In addition to um, the preventive maintenance inspections, we carry our own in-house uh, fleet audits conducted by myself and my fellow regional fleet managers. And these include weight checks as well in the vehicles. Our tire replacement policy is three millimeters tread depth, and we only procure high quality tires. Our fleet fit outs then are very high quality, very robust shelving, and uh, have adequate um, storage for all tools and equipment that drivers required. Um, we have uh, enhanced vehicle conspicuity as well. We flash in the LED lights in the front grille of the vehicles, in addition to the LED beacon on the roof. And we've chapter eight chevrons in the rear of the vehicle, also along on the door edges as well. We were fit reverse cameras along with parking sensors and reverse alarms on our vehicles as standard. And then when we're ordering vehicles, we order them with twin airbags as a standard requirement and a full height solid steel bulkhead between the driver and cargo compartments. In the four wheel drive uh, crew cab pickup vehicles, we fit a slide tray to ensure that it dissipates manual handling. So the entire contents, the entire floor area of the crew cab um, cargo compartment slides out towards the back to the, um, the tailgate, thereby enabling the driver to remove um, any cargo from the vehicle with ease. We work with a HSQE department that's health, safety and quality of environment to produce vehicle risk assessments. And then we have safety decals all over the vehicle, remind the drivers to wear their seat belts weight, weight um, capacity, tone capacity, vehicle height, uh, reminder to do your driver walk around checks and tire pressures and so on and so forth. We also then as well have a Hascon app as well, which basically if we're out in sight and we spot a safety issue, we can record the safety issue on this app and then it sets a deadline against remedial action in terms of the issue. So in terms of the driver, we'd have the, uh, we check that the driver defect books are completed. Um, we do training then as well for the daily walk around, uh, checks that the drivers have to do to be a classroom and practical element of that. We would also have presentations um, by Conor Donahue, who was a retired uh, Garda superintendent from the Traffic Corps, and he works in conjunction with Orange Works, one of our training providers. And then we have a quite a comprehensive training catalogue for all the drivers, um, an example of which advanced driver training, forward drive off road training, electric vehicle driving. We also carry out economic assessments for drivers if and when required. And then in terms of the journey, uh, we would issue telematic speed reports on a monthly basis to the water services departments. Um, for winter readiness, then we would have an, a fleet of all-wheel drive, forward drive vehicles. And then we'd issue safety bulletins, for example, work safe, home safe, and severe weather alerts as well. And also as well as a further measure, we're currently trialing a variable speed limiter on one of the vehicles that is linked to telematics and it knows the road speed limit at that location. So for example, if I'm in a 50 kilometer zone and I put my foot flat to the floor, I cannot go past 50 kilometers an hour. So this slide here just gives you an indication of um, our replacement policy. So you can see there for light commercial vehicles, for vans, it's six years or 250,000 kilometers, whichever is the sooner. So this slide then gives you an indication of our enhanced fleet safety on our vans. 
You can see the photograph there on the top left shows our um, our shelving design, quite a robust design. Um, so to take you through it, full solid steel bulkhead, twin airbags, Bluetooth fitted as standard on the radio, front and rear fog lights, front and rear LED warning lights, reverse and camera parking sensors, reverse alarm fitted as standard, chevrons on the rear door. We have a hand wash unit then fitted into the van as well um, for sanitary purposes. And with that, there's a paper towel holder and soap dispenser as well for the driver. Um, the use of uh, tablets, Irish Water have tablets for issuing work instructions to the driver. Those tablets are not allowed in the driver cabin when the vehicle is in motion. So we have a handheld unit, uh, tablet holder and charger in the cargo area fixed to the bulkhead, keeping it away from the driver when the vehicle is in motion. And then the safety stickers, uh, you can see them um, listed there on the uh, bottom of the slide. We also have a rotating air vent fitted as a standard to keep out any condensation that might build up from wet PPE or any uh, pumping infrastructure that might be re removed from a pump station or treatment plant to go to, back to um, a workshop for repair. So this slide here will give you an example of before and after in terms of the fleet replacement. The photograph on the left shows an old um, legacy water services van that was replaced last year with our new van there on the uh, right hand side. This uh, is an interior, a cargo area comparison. So the photograph on the left, uh, you can clearly see that there's no shelving, there's no solid steel bulkhead in the van, there's no hand wash unit facilities. So you can see all that is in place with the van that replaced it. Then in terms of water sampling, um, there are strict compliance regulations in terms of water sampling. You can see on the left hand photograph there that uh, the old van um, that is now replaced that didn't have a refrigerator unit in it therefore it was impossible to determine if the water sample was kept at four degrees C uh, on the way to the lab. So we replaced that with a newer van with a refrigerator unit in it and then comprehensive shelving in the first stamp for storing all sampling jars and um, water sampling sticks and you can see the blue uh, spray lining um, within the van, that's an antibacterial, uh, completely wipeable spray lining for hygienic purposes. And the bottom photograph there on the, the, the bottom right, that is a van that we have on trial, an electric van. We are trialing uh, the installation of a um, refrigerator unit in that to see what the EV suitability is like for water sampling. And I'm glad to say that the trial has proved to be a, a success. So taking on then to mechanical lifting aids, I alluded to earlier with the forward drive pickups that we put in the side tray. The photograph on the left uh, shows the side tray in place. And then the photograph on the right shows you a wheelchair lift that we put into one of the Dublin uh, medium vans. That was for lifting the roll saw in and out of the van. In terms of SI348 and the preventive maintenance inspections, we also do our own in-house inspections too. Um, we have a set of weight plates like what you see in the side there for carrying out um, weight compliance checks. And if we ever see a vehicle that is overweight, it's grounded immediately until the excessive weight is removed from the van. Telematics then, uh, we use telematics to record the mileage of the vehicle so we know when a vehicle is due for a service, but also as well, we use it to issue speeding reports to uh, the various water services departments. So you can see there, the system records the location of the speeding event, what the road speed limit was at the time, the date and time of the event, and what speed the vehicle was doing. This is another report uh, that is issued by the telematics. You can see there was a bit of a spike in um, speeding events earlier this year, but after issuing of the reports to the water service departments, you can see that it dropped off. This slide then shows you uh, the variable speed limiter that we're trialing at the moment. So you can see by that it says 50K, it's in a 50 kilometer an hour zone. So again, if I put my foot to the floor in that vehicle, I can't go past 50 kilometers an hour. This is a list of our um, comprehensive training catalog. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but I just refer to the ones that um, are relevant to um, vans. So we have vehicle familiarization, we have EV um, training courses, both in terms of charging the vehicle and how best to drive the vehicle to get your longest range possible out of the battery. Um, on the road driver support, off road driver training. Um, we actually wrote out beach driving training um, in one of the local authorities because they had to drive onto a beach to regularly inspect the water main and then towing up trailers and so on and so forth. So last year overall, we ran uh, 26 training courses, run over 102 days, and uh, we had 415 participants. 
COVID-19 um, obviously presented its challenges in the motor industry and the management of fleet. In the first lockdown, we had garages and test centres um, were, were closed, so that caused a backlog. So through regular meetings with our appointed fleet management provider, we helped mitigate the risks um, with regards to this, and we got back on track pretty quickly thereafter. Demand in an externally uh, sourced higher fleet was at a premium also because water services crews were having to comply with social distancing and meant that more and more vans throughout the country in various sectors were hired out to, um, to achieve that. Driver training then had to be restricted um, and mitigated where possible to a virtual classroom with practical element put on hold. Obviously, we couldn't have um, in-cap training at the time. Then the global demand on the semiconductor industry, along with factory shutdowns throughout Europe uh, and, and, and beyond, resulted in vehicle lead times dramatically increasing, both for new vehicles and for parts also as well. So that is an, an ongoing issue. Uh, when staff started returning to site then, we had initial spike in speeding um, that, was, that was noted in telematics. So further issue of uh, speeding reports to the water service departments um, that resulted in improvement in compliance. One big benefit of, well, I won't say a benefit, but I suppose one advantage during lockdown is that everyone got used to uh, using Zoom and Microsoft Teams and that has continued post restrictions and that has reduced the amount of times that we've had to spend going on the road to attend meetings in person. Clean Vehicles Directive then, um, all uh, procurement is in line with the green public procurement requirements. Uh, the Clean Vehicles Directive came into law last year, in August last year, so 38.5% of what we buy in terms of demands has to be electric. We have 15 electric vehicles now handed over and a further 15 in order. So we provide comprehensive training on the charge and driving of these vehicles to the drivers. Uh, we also conduct in independent in-house range testing uh, whenever we purchase a new make and model of electric vehicle. So we drive it on motorways, drive it at night, drive it on regional roads with a full load or an empty load. And we have a whole table uh, developed to provide to the drivers to give them an idea of given the circumstances of X and Y of, in terms of the journey, they expect to get Z range um, as they go along the road. We're also uh, doing evaluation of various home charging solutions. And as I said earlier, we did the trial with the uh, water sampler electric van. Accident investigation then, um, all accidents are fully investigated and uh, where required with the, the more serious ones, we liaise with uh, our health and safety department and issue safety bulletins and photos of said accident. So in other words, what happened, how did it happen, how to prevent a reoccurrence. Um, I'm glad to say none of the above resulted in any serious injuries. And then my final side then, uh, road traffic accidents post Irish water fleet start up. So this trend has two lines in it. The orange line is a uh, fleet quantity. So you see our fleet quantity um, increase over the years. And then the blue line is our, a ratio between the road traffic accident rate and our quantity of fleet. So we had a bit of a spike there last year and um, following investigations as, in terms of those incidents, um, I'm glad to say that we are on target to um, have a vast reduction in that ratio for 2022. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. I'm sure that everyone attending today's session will appreciate the great work that's been done in Irish Water on implementing safe driving for work practices. Now we're going to hear from Dr. John Garvey of Air Liquid. Today, he's going to discuss in, a, in detail sleepiness, driving and obstructive sleep apnea. And I'd like to again remind everybody that following this speaker, we're going to have a Q&A session. So make sure you submit your questions in the question box at the bottom of the screen. OK, over to you, John. Hi, I'm John Garvey. I'm a respiratory consultant in St. Vincent's University Hospital, and I'm also the director of the sleep service here. Uh, I'm going to cover sleepiness, driving and obstructive sleep apnea, which is a common sleep disorder. Uh, it's a respiratory problem during sleep, hence um, my interest in the condition. Um, I'm just going to play a short video because uh, we are going to be discussing uh, sleepiness at the wheel. And I really just want to help focus the mind with regard to uh, sleep related accidents and how serious they can be. So this was a driver, uh, an Irish driver actually in the UK, and uh, this was actually a typical sleep-related 
uh, accidents. So typically they're single vehicle collisions and the driver is alone in the vehicle and does not attempt to avoid the crash. So often you won't see any attempt uh, to brake or any brake marks on the road. The crash is, crash is likely to be serious and occur on a high-speed road. And the reason for that is that if you're on a, a secondary road, there um, a lot more twists and turns, whereas in a motorway, uh, such as we saw there, it's quite easy to drop off and not off. And this accident occurred at 7.10 in the morning. So typically sleep-related crashes occur late at night, early in the morning or in the mid-afternoon. And the mid-afternoon is often people can experience a little bit of a slump after they've eaten their lunch in terms of their energy levels and their levels of alertness. So sleepiness at the wheel is extremely common. So uh, this is data from the Road Safety Authority, which has been highlighted in, highlighted, uh, in the press in Ireland. And almost a quarter of drivers in Ireland have admitted that they have driven at least once over the previous month when they were so tired that they had trouble keeping their eyes open. We have about one in six drivers who have admitted that they had fallen asleep or nodded off at the wheel. And it is estimated that fatigue is a factor in one in five of the deaths of drivers in Irish roads. And when you look at the populations that are most at risk, it's young men, people working night shift or people doing shift work where they're shifting their um, sleep pattern, their work pattern, um, shifting their body clock. And then people with sleep disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea. So what is obstructive sleep apnea? Well, obstructive sleep apnea is a common respiratory condition. Um, it is associated with snoring. So this graphic just shows what the upper airway looks like during wakefulness. And we breathe through our mouth, through our nose, and take air into our lungs. But when we are awake, the muscle tone in our upper airway is increased, and that allows the upper airway to stay open, to stay patent. And it means as you take a breath in, that the airway doesn't collapse down. But in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, once they fall asleep, their muscle tone reduces, that you get a collapsibility of the upper airway. So they typically snore because uh, initially, with the, as the airway collapses down, you get turbulence of airflow, which leads to noise or noisy breathing. And then as the airway collapses down fully, because essentially your lungs sucking air in is like a vacuum sucking on the area, uh, the airway collapses down completely. So patients often waken with a gasp or a snorter. They may not awaken at all, may not be aware of this, but they can do it repeatedly throughout the night. Day to day, this can cause a fragmentation of sleep. So it impacts on sleep quality and patients feel less refreshed. Long term, this can have other consequences. And then particularly in men, this can increase your risk of cardiovascular problems long term. So that's high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, funny heart rhythm, sudden death. They're all associated in particular with severe obstructive sleep apnea which is symptomatic. So how common is this? Well, this is data from a paper a few years ago, uh, which looked at this. And we actually now think um, that there are a billion people on the planet who have obstructive sleep apnea. And in Ireland, you, we have probably over half a million people with obstructive sleep apnea and over 100,000 people who have moderately severe disease. Now, I am not saying that every single one of these patients is sleepy. I'm not saying that uh, every single one of these patients is aware of it, but snoring is extremely common. And as weight has increased in society over the last few decades, um, that is the biggest risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea. So it means obstructive sleep apnea is now more common uh, than any other respiratory disorder, and it's far more common than we think. So if you think you could have it, what do you need to do? Well, the traditional way to test for it is done through hospitals, done by specialists like me, 
where you wear the equipment while you sleep, but we detect what's happening. So this man is wearing a band around his chest, a band around his tummy. He's got uh, electrodes on his eyes and on his brain, head, recording his brain tracing. There's a microphone in place for de detecting snoring. So we can do this in patients in hospital, or we can do it at home. This is called full polysomnography. Um, but it's well recognized that simpler signals can point towards things. So this is just simply measuring the patient's oxygen levels over the course of the night. And uh, if patients have severe enough obstructive sleep apnea, um, this can be picked up. So this top line is somebody who is asleep, doesn't have obstructive sleep apnea, where you see an even pattern where the saturations are around 95% all night, okay? The, the lower graphic is somebody who has very severe obstructive sleep apnea. And once they fall asleep, there's massive fluctuation in their oxygen levels um, as their airway closes off when they're asleep. And, you know, if somebody has severe enough disease as this, um, it's, you know, not any extra benefit to do the in-hospital testing with polysomnography, in my opinion. And I suppose this is a relevance because we're now moving into a, a realm where we can use smarter devices. So this is an Israeli device called the WatchPad, which is well validated for testing for obstructive sleep apnea quite easily at home. Patients just pop the watch on their wrist. They connect uh, the probe on their finger, which records their oxygen tracings. And there's another probe, which will record snoring and chest wall movement that they put over their breastbone. And they simply pair it with their phone via Bluetooth. And that will um, beam the data to um, a program which runs a, an algorithm on it and a report with regard to uh, the patient's sleep study is sent to the patient's doctor. So this is a more modern way of testing for obstructive sleep apnea. And we're actually seeing now that I have quite a few patients that come to me and they say that their smartwatch has actually pointed towards that their oxygen levels are fluctuating at night. So you can see on the top uh, right-hand corner, that's a Garmin watch which is giving measures of oxygen level. You have an Apple Watch just below it. Um, on the bottom left, you have Fitbit. So all of these are coming in uh, to this area. But above that, again, there's actually a French device which has already been FDA approved uh, in the States um, and CE marked and can give, uh, it's CE marked in Europe and can give an est estimation of the severity of, of obstructive sleep apnea. So these are devices um, that can test for more significant levels of the disorders. And I think we're going to see more and more of these used over the coming years. If you have it, we need to look at treating it. And uh, the most common treatment for uh, the condition is CPAP therapy. So if you need to open up the airway because it's completely blocked during sleep, you can do that by wearing a mask that is blowing air under pressure into the upper airway. And that splints the upper airway open, it cushions it open just with air. So this is what one of the devices looks like. So these started out 40 years ago as vacuum cleaners with the motor turned the other way around, essentially. But now they're extremely quiet, virtually silent. So this is a Philips uh, product. Uh, this is what it looks like. It even has a humidifier at the back where the tubing connects into it. And in terms of the masks, uh, that are used. There's a huge variety uh, of masks that are used. Uh, this is a nasal mask that's just sitting underneath the nostrils, but patients often have masks that may fit over their mouth and nose. Uh, there's a big move by the CPAP companies to ensure that uh, the spouses or bed partners are happy with regard to this uh, because uh, snoring is associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So this device um, can actually cure that. And I think they're trying to get across that message in some respects, uh, possibly with this graphic. Um, so with regard to driver safety, uh, obstructive sleep apnea is uh, an important condition to give consideration to. And it is included uh, in our medical fitness to drive guidelines. And uh, these are updated um, annually uh, by the Road Safety Authority. 
And with regard to obstructive sleep apnea, this is the guidance that, is, that exists. And it's pan-European. Um, so uh, anytime you look at these um, standards that we apply here, and there's a European flag, it means that irrespective of the country in the EU, these are the, the standards which apply. So we've, we've moved towards ensuring uniformity with regard to this. So you can have obstructive sleep apnea and drive, okay? The issue with regard to any sleep disorder is that uh, if you have symptoms, so if you're feeling sleepy at the wheel, then you shouldn't drive. And we have a different standard for group one drivers and group two, but I have lots of uh, group two drivers who attend my clinic and who come in, they're coming for assessment because they snore, they have cardiovascular problems, they want to reduce their uh, cardiovascular risk, and if they have no problems driving, I allow them to continue to drive. So it is not a case that if you have untreated obstructive sleep apnea that you cannot drive. The issue arises when you actually have the syndrome. So you have the condition and it is associated with significant symptoms during the day. So if you're falling asleep at the wheel, it's very simple. You shouldn't be driving until we treat this. But this is a condition which we can treat and we can reverse. So once patients are treated and we have satisfactory control of their symptoms, and this is being confirmed by a specialist, there is no problem at all with them continuing to drive. So I have lots of patients where I have told them as well, initially um, to stop driving. Uh, I have managed to diagnose them, initiate them in treatment, and then get them to recommence uh, driving again. So uh, my message is to encourage patients to come forward to seek uh, assessment with regard to this condition. Uh, there is a difference in how we follow up patients with regard to the condition. So if you have a Category 1 license, so a regular driving license, uh, you can extend your review to just up to three years. And licensing may be slightly different with uh, uh, up to three years as well. Uh, whereas if you have a Group 2 license, this becomes something where you need regular, normally annual licensing review. And... Um, they have standards with regard to, it's mentioned here with regard to uh, compliance. We can track that on the device to ensure that we can clearly demonstrate that uh, if you're using your machine, that we can show that you've used it, you've used it for an adequate amount of hours. So there's a protection there for drivers with regard to this. We can also show uh, on the device that we have completely corrected your obstructive sleep apnea. So gotten the level of uh, obstructive sleep apnea back to a level which is completely regarded as normal. Uh, and we just need to reduce that so that you can see here to a level of mild disease is adequate for licensing purposes. But a specialist opinion is the piece that actually comes into trump this. So just to finish, and to point out sleep-related collisions are a significant contributor to road traffic deaths. In professional drivers, sleep deprivation is a major risk factor as well. So I'm talking about sleep quality with regard to obstructive sleep apnea, but you have to remember sleep quantity is extremely important. And if you don't get enough sleep, that's a problem. OSA increases your risk of accidents. And we know that professional drivers with the OSA uh, have, um, have our professional drivers have a high prevalence of OSA, but treating with CPAP therapy can reduce the risk of accidents in this group. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dr. Garvey, for taking the time to speak with us today. Very interesting topic. Now, I just like to thank all of today's speakers for their time and their work in ensuring that we can inform and educate employers about how to implement safe driving for work practices for employees. Um, what we're going to do now is start our Q&A session. Um, so we have a number of questions that um, I know that we need to get through, so I will press on. Uh, first question is directed to Justin Martin uh, for the Road Safety Authority. Justin. What method do RSA use for selecting vehicles for inspections during roadside checks carried out with Angarda Shiakona? 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, a good question. Um, I suppose I, any of the attendees today who might have mixed fleets of heavy and light commercial vehicles will be familiar with the risk indicator tool, the commercial vehicle operator risk indi indicator tool that we use. So into that is fed a previous inspection history with operators and the type of infringements and the results of their CVR tests, et cetera. And that calculates a risk score. And we focus on high and medium risk operators at the roadside. So our, our officers use an app on their phone to check the registration number of the vehicle. And it gives them back the details of the risk score. And then a decision is made to inspect or not to inspect. They're given an instruction on their screen. Um, there are some exceptions to the rule, such that from time to time, we may not have internet connectivity where we're doing a roadside check and we'd inspect all vehicles or our colleagues in the Gardaí economy may request the inspection or we might have intelligence on an operator. We might inspect um, uh, independent of what the risk rating is, is, is giving us as, as, a, as an answer. So I hope that kind of clarifies it. But the, the, the main thing is we focus our uh, limited resources on inspecting those operators that our, that our, our risk rating tool tells us um, are the highest risk. Thanks. Okay. No, that, that's, that's clear. Thanks, Justin. Another question, um, this is towards, um, it's actually directed to Deirdre in the HSA. Deirdre, as an employer, how can I realistically have any influence over employees when they're out and about driving for work? Thanks, Alison. That's a very good question. Although the driver is ultimately responsible for how the vehicle is driven on the road uh, on any given day, uh, an employer can have a very substantial influence on the driver and the, and, and, and the driver, can, the employer can't have direct control there and then on the road uh, over the vehicle and driver. Um, however, uh, employers can take action beforehand to ensure that risks associated with driving for work are properly controlled uh, and such practical actions would include as part of a safety management system, uh, a driver selection process, which includes driver vetting and license checks, for example, and ensuring that drivers have the correct license for the vehicle being given at any being driven at any time. And that also includes uh, checks around fitness to drive and medical fitness to drive would be included in that also uh, for group one and, and group two drivers. Um, Employers can select the safest, safest company vehicles possible and ensuring that those vehicles are safe and fit for purpose at all times. So in compliance with roadworthiness uh, legislation at all times by having systems in place uh, to ensure that that happens. Um, risk assessing driving for work activities and all that goes with them. So having risk assessments and out of those risk assessments would fall uh, clear clear procedures around uh, driving for work activities, um, providing instruction, training and information to drivers and keeping that up to date as, as, as uh, business uh, changes and, 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 and risks emerge. And, and such, such things like a driver's handbook would be very helpful in reminding drivers of what's expected of them when they are driving for work. Uh, providing safe uh, safety and personal protective equipment, for example, high visibility jackets, warning triangles in case of a vehicle breakdown, and suitable safety footwear and weatherproof clothing. Um, and I suppose an ongoing, uh, ongoing promotion and conversation around good driving behaviour to reinforce um, expected uh, behaviour and standards uh, of people uh, who drive for work. And I suppose another very important thing um, is safe scheduling and planning of journey so that drivers have enough time to carry out the journey safely, because inadequate planning can result in poor driver behavior, speeding, and as we've heard earlier, driving driver fatigue, which are very, very substantial risk factors uh, for driving for work. Okay, well, thanks very much, Deirdre. No, there's lots and lots of questions, guys, so we'll move along. Um, this one is actually directed um, to you, um, Inspector Darty, the blood alcohol level. What is the sorry the blood alcohol level for a professional driver when driving a car? Is it based on the license or the vehicle being driven on the occasion that they're um, 
the limit for that would be 20 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood and in respect to the vehicle it's in relation to the type of vehicle being driven so for a commercial vehicle let's say a cd or w license um it will be if you're driving that vehicle at the time however if you had one of those licenses and you're driving your private car in private business obviously that wouldn't apply to you however a b license for small sub public service vehicles and um, it would apply in that case as well so a taxi driver for example going about his business would be a specified driver under the act and that's okay what Okay, well, that's clear. And hopefully that's answered that question for that individual. Um, another question um, for Velma um, this time. Velma, that was, I think it was mentioned, um, you mentioned LCVs are involved in 7% of fatal collisions. Um, how does that compare with HGVs? Are they more likely to be involved in collisions or not? Yes, um, in fact, they are. So for the same comparable time periods, 2017 to 2021, 11% of fatal collisions involved a HGV driver. So it is somewhat higher uh, for fatal collisions. I, I would say, however, and caution that, that in the vast majority of cases, it's not in fact the HGV driver who is killed, but it is the other party to the collision. And really that's testament to the size and the weight of those vehicles that if they're involved in a collision with uh, a car or indeed um, a pedestrian or a cyclist, it's actually the other party that comes off worse. So that's something really to be mindful of as drivers of those very large heavy vehicles. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, and Ken, there's a question um, just come in for you. Um, did Irish Water see a significant change uh, in manual handling injuries after installing the slider in the vans? Um, nothing was supported our way anyway in, in the free team, but um, I can tell you the driver feedback was fantastic. Um, yes, yes. Once we, when we hand over a vehicle, we give an induction to the driver and we take them through the whole vehicle. And when we came around to the back and showed them the uh, slider, um, they were seriously impressed. Mm. And uh, it's something that's become a standard feature on those particular vehicles since. Yeah, great. No, I think that it, now we have, I just want to say we have a number of questions that have come in and we're going to endeavour to respond to those questions and put them up on our Driving for Work website, along with all of the presentations that have been um, done today, so that everyone will have access to those resources. And we hope to have um, the, the resources up there later this afternoon. So I'd like to thank everybody again for the, for the Q&A. Um, Everybody who's listening, um, as I mentioned at the start of the session, it was estimated and it is estimated that one in three road collisions that happen every year as, as a result of driving for work. So we hope that by, by providing you with these kind of um, webinars and information that we're helping you to create safe driving for work practices. Again, thanks to all the speakers and all the employers who are working with us in achieving our Vision Zero um, goal. Um, we are aiming to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2050. Um, I'd like to all thank you again for attending and for participating in the Q&A and providing us with those questions for our panellists. All of, as I said, all of the resources are going to be available online later today. Um, we'd ask you that you get on the Driving for Work website. There's a lot of advice and safe driving practices up there and toolkits available to all of your um, employees and yourselves as employers. Um, thanks again for joining us this morning, and I really hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. Thank you.